for this Christmas day comes from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice, from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And our epistle reading today comes from the book of Hebrews, beginning at chapter 1, verse 1, continuing through verse 5. God's supreme revelation. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, whom he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son. Today I have begotten you, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Here ends the second reading. And our gospel reading for this day comes from the second chapter of Luke, beginning at the first verse. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, every one to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things 
and pondered them in her heart. And then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. Here ends the reading. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to hear your word proclaimed to us this morning, we pray that our hearts would be glad and ready to receive it. So we pray, Heavenly Father, that our eyes would be open, that our ears would be attentive, that our mind would be focused, and that all of our attention would be centered on your word for us this day. We pray this prayer in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, our title for today's sermon, The Infant of Infantry. When Luke wrote his gospel, he began by providing a context for why he wrote what he included in his book. And Luke chapter 1, verse 1 begins with these introductory words. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Now, Dr. Luke, that physician, provided context also for chapters moving forward. In the scriptures. Now, if we were to pass over momentarily to from the second chapter and go into the third, we would read that same kind of setup. Luke chapter 3, verse 1. Now, in the 50th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of Iturea, and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John the Baptist, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. So here again, we hear those same words of setting a picture of what is going to be described in these words, giving us a context. Okay, now we return again to the one for which we just jumped over. Luke chapter 2, no exception. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. In this sense, this first took place when Quirinius was governing Syria. Or if you're happening to follow along in your Bible, in the King James Version, it's sometimes transliterated as Serenius. But you get the point. Luke wants you to know what situation this story is being embedded in. He's providing the backdrop. And he's making a larger point though beyond just simply giving us a backdrop. He's telling us theological things we're going to see. He's not just telling us political circumstances and data. He's giving us a way of understanding that Jesus Christ is a king, just like Caesar Augustus was a king. He's helping us make the connections in our minds. Now you might be thinking, well, duh, we all know that Jesus is a king. I mean, we remember that, that Magi came from the east and asked Herod about the location of this newborn baby boy, and they wanted to find him so they could pay him homage. But your knowledge about Herod and Jesus in this setting comes from the Gospel of Matthew, and you're letting that bleed in to your understanding of where Luke is trying to get you to go. And so Luke then, he does mention Herod in that setup that I just read for you, but he's not elaborating on anything because he is wanting to make a point about Jesus and Augustus. Now anybody who would have read this story in that time, just as like we still do today, understand that, there is, that Caesar is a king, that Jesus is a king. But the connection is much deeper and richer than simply just acknowledging that they both come from monarchies of different times. The connection is more rich than simply understanding that Mary and Joseph traveled to Bethlehem because Caesar had in instituted this taxation, this registration, this census, and they were coming to fulfill that. It's much greater than that. Because Jesus, as Luke is preparing us in these scriptures, is the center of all human experience, that he is the center of all history. 
And it is from the context of these lives, an important life and an extremely important life, that we see who Jesus really is for the world and also for you and your soul. And so we look at a few of these comparisons that help us understand exactly how great of a Savior and King and military commander that Jesus Christ is over all the history of human time. First of all, we can see as we compare these two lives of Caesar and Jesus that both of them had an unusual relationship with their father. As a young boy, Caesar Augustus had been frequently sick, and he made no particular impression on people. He was just very average. But in his early years of manhood, he developed into being a great warrior. And despite his occasional health issues, he finally made a good impression on his great uncle. And who was his great uncle but Julius Caesar? Julius Caesar's life ended at a short age. And as his last will and testament was being read, that Caesar Augustus heard that he had inherited the throne from his great uncle. Talk about a day of change for him. What an impressive story that is. But Jesus had an even greater inheritance from his heavenly father. And the blessing was experienced both ways. That while Joseph was just an ordinary man, just as Mary was an ordinary uh, woman, that Joseph had a greater calling even than for Julius Caesar and for Caesar Augustus. Because Joseph had the divine calling and the great privilege, just as Mary had, that he was able to protect Jesus. That he was the one who, following the Lord's leading by receiving that dream, took him to Egypt to provide safety for him and then brought him back when the coast was clear. And while the annals of history might not see that as being as historically significant as Caesar Augustus receiving the throne from his dead great uncle. In terms of your life and your experience, you know which one of those two things is more important for your eternal life. We think also, as we compare these two great kings of history, how Jesus Christ received worship in the flesh. As we remember the arrival of the Magi, that they came, that they brought him gifts, and they came to bring him homage. And they, in fact, were so dedicated to this task that they endangered their lives because as they encountered Herod, and Herod told them, I want to know where, where this baby is too so I can worship him. But they realized that if they had gone back to Herod and fulfilled the law there, that they would have been physically harmed. And so they were warned in a dream as well to return to another way. So it was the same with Caesar Augustus that we think that we build up our, our leaders nowadays with social media where we can praise them and make uh, statements that uh, flatter them. So was Caesar Augustus and Julius Caesar, for that matter. They were called divine beings, that they were thought of as being important people who should be honored. And if you didn't honor them, there was something wrong with you. You weren't being a good citizen. When the bad things in life happened, like tornadoes or hurricanes, you're to blame because you weren't doing your part as a citizen. It'd be like looking at people in our own communities today and saying, you're not being a good neighbor. You're not paying your taxes. Caesar received worship and praise too, and he encouraged that practice. But we all know who is really worthy of our worship and our adoration and our attention. Yes, we fulfill our callings in life that you are called to pay taxes and and that uh, you are called to participate in, in government and all those kinds of things because God has entrusted you with responsibilities. But Jesus is the only one worthy of our worship. An interesting comparison as you put these two lives together. As you think of Caesar Augustus and again his great uncle Julius Caesar, that both of them ruled in these kinds of arrangements called triumvirate. That's how they were able to seize power because they were able to bring on other allies with themselves that they could then capture the government. 
And so both these two men engaged in such a thing. But you can imagine, just as you know how politics is today, that the position at the top does not like to be shared. And there is a skill and a charisma that usually comes to one leader that distinguishes him from the other. And there was no exception to that in millennia past. As we say so wisely in our own communications, we say you can't have too many cooks in the kitchen. And that's how it was. And they were always drawn into battle. They were always drawn into competition with one another. And that's why each of them constantly had to try to keep their opposition at arm's length. This is not how it is with our Lord. That our Lord exists in the Holy Trinity in perfect obedience of the Son to the Father. And the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. We think in the scriptures of Philippians chapter 2 that the Son made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming into the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. See, Christ perfectly obeyed the will of his Father. As he saw the, his arrest and his crucifixion coming, what did he pray in the Garden of Gethsemane? Not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus is the one worthy of our worship. Luke was on to something, as you can see already, is you see these kind of interesting comparisons that come between Caesar Augustus and our true Lord. But there also is something to be noticed, too, in even how the two of them, be, I should say between how Caesar Augustus had troubles even with his friends. Because we think this morning also, uh, in the triumvirate of Caesar Augustus, that there was a man named Mark Antony. Now, and just to be clear, I'm not speaking about the Mark Antony, the meteorologist and news anchor up at Alexandria, broadcasting on cool TV. I'm speaking instead of the, the original Alexandria, Alexandria, Egypt. And Caesar Augustus became so embroiled in competition with Mark Antony and the triumvirate that due to their battling for position, that Mark Antony and his cunning and beautiful girlfriend, wife, whatever you want to call her, Cleopatra, that they fled to Egypt and both eventually committed suicide because they had, their lives had been totally ruined by trying to compete with Augustus, and they were not able to do so. See, that's how it is in the world, that there's only room for one person in the ways of the world. There's only one winner, and there are many losers. But it's not that way in the body of Christ that each one of us who has Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we are victors. It doesn't matter how much money you have, how much prestige you have, how much good reputation you have with others. That's not what counts in God's eyes. Just like that's not what counted when Jesus was born in a simple manger in a stable. It wasn't the possessions or the comfort that he had as he came into this world, but it was who he is. And for us, then, it is whose we are. The people of Israel, when they saw Jesus grow up and begin his public ministry and to preach and proclaim, they were amazed by him. And as they saw that there was something special about him, that they thought, this man must be the Messiah. This man must be the one who's going to come to deliver us. He's going to throw off Roman rule. He's going to bring in a new era of peace and good feelings. And we are finally going to be restored to who we are as the elect people of God. But as we know, that just as Jesus Christ came humbly into this world, he was humbly going to leave this world as well. That yes, Jesus Christ is a divine commander. That he does have people who march in his army, but it is not for gaining lands and territory and fame. That is recorded in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Jesus said, I come not to bring peace, but a sword. But Christ's struggle is not directed against earthly principalities and powers. Jesus 
Jesus is spiritually, militarily greater than Caesar Augustus ever could have been. And how do we know that Jesus Christ has those who march in his army? And it's the Christmas story. We look at Luke chapter 2, and we read about the angels. And what do we hear from them about peacekeeping? Well, the angel Gabriel appears in two places in the scriptures. In Luke chapter 1 and 2, like we're familiar with, but also in the Old Testament, in Daniel chapters 8 and 9. And in this book of the Old Testament, we read that the angels are not only announcers, they are not only guardians of your way, but they are also warriors. They engage in spiritual combat against evil and darkness. As we think even in Jesus' passion, as he was hanging on the cross, that he could have called 12 legions of angels, 10,000 angels, and they would have been there and rescued him just like that. But Jesus' war, Jesus' conflict is not with earthly armies, but it is against darkness and wickedness and unbelief. And so, as we compare two great lives, one great in the history of the world and one great for the history of all humanity, we recognize that each of them has a place, that we do recognize earthly authority, that just because we would not have worshipped Caesar 2,000 years ago doesn't mean that we don't obey our authorities today as long as they do not make us sin. The Apostle Paul, when he was on trial, that he made as part of his defense this statement. We read this in Acts chapter 25, verse 8. I have not offended Caesar. And we remember also that the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day forced that same question upon Christ. That when they handed him a coin, they said to him, Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? And what did our Lord respond with? Rend unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God's. When it comes to earthly things, we are glad to have stability and organization, that there is an army to protect us when invaders come. But when it comes to the loyalty of your soul, there is no bifurcation. There is no both and. We read in the book of Acts, chapter 17, about a man named Jason. And Jason was accused of having Christians meet in his home. And as the chargers brought their case against them, they said the following, that of this man and his group, Jesus is king and Caesar is nothing. Now in terms of civil issues, that is not the case as Jesus so clearly exemplified. But in terms of your soul, there is only one monarch who rules in your heart. When the issue is worship, when the issue is idols or ideologies, be faithful to Christ alone. Now the religious leaders of Israel's day chose poorly in this respect. They chose Caesar Augustus, instead of Israel's Messiah. Because what did they say as Pilate washed his hands, that Roman pro procurator? As he washed his hands, the crowd shouted in response, We have no king but Caesar. It was left to those few Romans, not among the elect of God's beloved out of Abraham, who recognized that Jesus Christ is indeed Lord of heaven and earth. In Matthew chapter 8, we read about the Roman centurion whose son was dying. And Jesus encountered him and said that he would go to his house and see him. But what did that man say? Lord, I'm not worthy to have you under my roof. Simply speak the words and my son shall be healed. We think of that Roman soldier upon looking at Jesus Christ hanging on the cross and as he breathed his last, what did that Roman soldier say? Truly this man was the Son of God. Both Caesar and Jesus Christ secure peace. Each deserves credit in their own way. It's said that in the Roman Empire at the times of Christ's life and his ministry and the disciples following, that part of the reason that the gospel was able to go forward so 
quickly and so efficiently, never mind the truthfulness of the story. But that part of the reason that it was able to spread so quickly was because there was something in effect called the Pax Romana. The roads were paved. There were not bandits on the streets. It was a time where the gospel was able to go forward and Paul and Peter were able to travel from city to city. And so we give thanks to our God that there was a civil order there that permitted such things. But once again, the calling to worship belongs to God alone. As Jesus said in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, My peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. And his peace on earth is much more profound than simply wishing away an absence of conflict in your life. That's not what his peace is. His peace is something much deeper than any treaty signed by two nations that would pledge one not to attack the other. Christ's peace is so much more powerful than if all the na- leaders of all the nations of the earth were to gather together and say, no more war. Because as Paul reminds us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, that the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. This is the peace that we celebrate when we read the Christmas story. This is the peace, not simply goodwill to our neighbors, as nice as that is. This is the peace that is unlike peace time between war, as wonderful it is not to have conflict. But there is something much greater than any peace that you can find upon earth. And we see this in the structure of time itself. We think of the calendar. The month of July is named after whom? Julius Caesar. The month of August is named after Caesar Augustus. We might think that our Lord is being shortchanged here. He's got the name of Christmas, 12 days. But we forget that all of our years are remembered by his birth. B.C., before Christ, A.D., Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord, in Latin. And even in our growing secular age, where people would put aside those terms and substitute instead before the common era, And the common era, as you see more frequently in publications, it's the same exact calculation. It's still dated after Jesus' birth. And so it is that Jesus controls all time, that his reign has no limit to it, that he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And because he knows all things, And because he is Lord over all time, that he knows everything about you. And we think one more time again of these great Roman histories, of the military campaigns of Caesar, Julius Caesar, and Caesar Augustus, and the armies that they amassed, 30,000 men marching off into battle. Do you think that Caesar Augustus knew who each one of his soldiers was? No way. Does Jesus Christ know who you are? Yes, he does. He knows each hair upon your head. He knows each care and each worry that you have. He calls you to cast each one of your concerns upon him in prayer. So if you ever get discouraged, thinking that the powers of this world are increasing in their influence and authority, just remember, go back 2,000 years. It looked pretty impressive by the world standards then. But Jesus Christ came into that experience and into that situation and he hasn't left yet. Yes, his physical body has ascended into heaven, but he continues to reign in each one of our hearts. That He numbers each one of us. He knows each thing about you and calls you his beloved child. And so just as we celebrate the birth of our Lord again this day, we also celebrate the new birth that he has given to each one of you. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king, born to raise each child on earth, born to give them second birth. And so as we celebrate his nativity this day, we also celebrate his new birth in you. I pray that you know that new birth, that you know him 
as Lord and Savior, that you count yourself among his army, if you will. Yes, you maybe have never put on any military gear in your life, but Christ is calling you to march with him straight into eternity. And I pray that that is the ultimate, the center, the, the place from which all other things in this life are interpreted through that. We give great thanks to our Lord that he deigned himself to come as a baby boy to show each one of us that he is the Lord of all the universe. Let's pray about that today. Heavenly Father, as we read your word and think about this chapter, Luke chapter 2, and how many times each one of us has probably heard those words, and how we can continue to pick new things through it, Lord, just as we think on uh, Caesar Augustus and his great uncle Julius Caesar, and Lord, how such important people they were in the civilization of the Western world, and indeed they made a very significant But Lord, their biographies are nothing. Absolutely nothing compared to the impact of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, who entered into this world faithfully, obeying his Father to come and to preach the gospel and to spread the news of the kingdom so that each one of us, Lord, could be citizens of him, to have our names written in the book of life. So, Lord, I pray for each person gathered here today that each one of us, Lord, would know our place and would number ourselves among uh, his his beloved uh, army. That, Lord, you call us not to swords clashing and conflict, but, Lord, the army that you call us into is an army of deliverance, of freeing people through our words, Lord, that you would use us to get that word out, that there is a peace that this world cannot offer us. And so we thank you, Heavenly Father, that we have the true peace which abides in our hearts through faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.